A Little Boy Lost by William Blake is a poem about the destruction of childhood innocence in Blake's era, destroyed by an overbearing religious presence. Not spirituality, remember Blake was not against religion itself, but by the organisation of the church. I'll briefly go through the poem's plot, its themes, its links to the elements of political and social protest, as well as going through a couple of key writers' methods and techniques which you can explode in your essays. But first, let's read the poem. Nought loves another as itself, nor venerates another so, nor is it possible to thought a greater than itself to know. And father, how can I love you, or any of my brothers more? I love you like the little bird, that picks up crumbs around the door. The priest sat by and heard the child. In trembling zeal he seized his hair. He led him by his little coat, and all admired his priestly care. And, standing on the altar high, Lo, what a fiend is here, said he, one who sets reason up for judge of our most holy mystery. The weeping child could not be heard. The weeping parents wept in vain. They stripped him to his little shirt, and bound him in an iron chain, and burned him in a holy place where many had been burned before. The weeping parents wept in vain. Are such things done on Albion's shore? The story behind the poem is that a child in church has questioned the teachings of the priest. He's asked, why is it possible that we are supposed to love all equally and yet love God more? He says he can't. He loves the priest in the same way he loves the bird, and he loves his brothers. After all, love is taught as a gift from God. However, the priest does not like this idea of his teachings being questioned, and he says, Lo, what a fiend is here! He calls the boy a fiend, and accuses him of setting reason up for judge of our most holy mystery, essentially applying logic and reason to something which should be left to be mysterious. Though Blake was a critic of the Age of Reason and the ideas of the Enlightenment, he was also a staunch defender of childhood innocence. And what's more innocent of a child than asking questions of their teachers? The priest, however, sees any questioning as hostile to the church itself, and so he uh, grabs the child by the hair, a very violent action for a priest, especially when one usually associates priests as taking their congregation by the hand and leading them to spiritual and religious enlightenment. No, he takes him by the hair and binds him in a chain, again, her metaphor will unpack later, and burned him in a holy place, so burns him at the stake, while the parents look on and weep. Interestingly enough, though, all admired his priestly care as he led him by his little coat. It suggests that society itself doesn't see much of an issue with what the priest is doing. Maybe a commentary on how society is uh, enamoured with the propaganda and the control that religion has over the minds of the people. So overall a very bleak poem and fitting quite nicely into the darker tone of the poems of Songs of Experience. Now, the key elements of political and social protest this applies to uh, could be human organisation, the idea of the, the church suppressing and squashing any kind of resistance or questioning to their divine authority. Uh, it also ties into the idea of resistance, uh, especially the idea that the church is hostile to any resistance or any questioning of their teachings, but also arguably the innocence of the boy's resistance. He doesn't see what he's doing as in any way problematic or confrontational. He's just an innocent child asking questions. Again, we know a child's favourite question to ask is, why? Well, all this child is saying is, well, how can I love God more than I love my brothers or more than I love this little bird? He's asking a perfectly innocent question, but it's responded to with violence. And that ties us to probably the most significant theme uh, of this, oppression. There is this sense that the priest is the main, the primary oppressive force in the poem. He represents the church. He represents the institution of the church. And the way he acts and the way he silences any questioning, by leading him by his little coat, seizing the boy by the hair, and burning him at the stake, symbolises how religion was shutting down any and all criticism of what he calls, as he says, the most holy mystery. 
To a lesser extent, there's also a sense of powerlessness, especially when it comes to the parents. The parents wept in vain. It says it twice. The weeping parents wept in vain. The weeping parents wept in vain in the penultimate and the final stanza. It shows that even if the parents wished to act, or if they were in any way kind of proactive in preventing their child's suffering, um, they had no real power over the priest. They wept in vain. It was pointless. They couldn't do anything. The child, by asking the question, has sealed his fate. Um, it does also seem to comment on the unfairness of society, so in a way how society is reflected in the modern world and how it was reflecting Blake's own society. Uh, Blake did believe that the institution of the church held far too much power and far too much sway over the beliefs of the masses. Remember, the church and the government and or the crown and the monarchy kind of worked hand in hand. The teachings of the church are that the king is God and the government, the monarch, did allow the tithe, which was a tax specifically paid to the church, to be paid. So it kind of it benefited the church and the monarchy that they both remained in existence. Any questioning of that would be seen as treason or heresy, hence the severe punishment for the child. The rhyme scheme is deceptively simple. A, B, C, B. Itself, so, thought, no. You, more, bird, door. And it kind of disguises the much more sinister implications of the priest. Maybe a commentary on how, though the priest may preach lessons about love and uh, the kind of the divine benevolence of God, the actual menace, the sinister nature of what the priest is teaching is often hidden below the surface. The rhyme scheme is therefore quite deceptive to the reader. The first two stanzas of the poem, the child is the speaker, an uninterrupted uh, eight-line questioning of the priest's teachings. And it is interesting that Blake gives the child this voice. It's uninterrupted for two whole stanzas, and they're both complete thoughts. Um, he's asking, essentially, and father, how can I love you or any of my brothers more? Um, he's able to vocalise his question. Blake doesn't silence the child in the same way the priest is about to. Uh, however, the final four stanzas are all uh, the kind of the consequences, the reaction of the priest. You could argue it's a very early volta. The priest sat by and heard the child. In trembling zeal, he seized his hair. Now that phrase, trembling zeal, suggests that the priest was so overcome with kind of a, a passion at hearing the child questioning that he was trembling with rage and seized his hair. Very violent actions for a person, a priest, who we would usually associate with a softness of character, a gentleness. Um, if you think like a parish vicar, um, I always think of something like, say, Geraldine Granger from the Vicar of Dibley TV programme. You don't expect her to, you know, with trembling zeal, seize someone's hair. But this priest is a very violent character. And remember, back when Blake was writing, it was a faith militant. It was a kind of, they, they, had, they did choose violence to defend their faith. Um, th this was common practice at, at the time. Not necessarily to burn children alive for asking questions, but the sense that if your faith is challenged, it is your, your honour-bound duty to defend it, even if that means resorting to violence. In Britain, for example, punishments for heresy up to the 1600s included records of whipping or having stones thrown at you or hard labour. Um, but throughout the world, uh, for example, in Spain, the last person to be executed for heresy uh, was executed in 1826. So it shows that the kind of animosity towards what would be perceived as heretical, any anti-religious talk, was still punished quite severely throughout the world. Now, the figure of the priest could be a metaphor or a microcosm for the wider church. And if you think about its violent actions, you can uh, quite easily see that as an extended metaphor for the way the church has silenced criticism over the years in a way that Blake saw as very distasteful and very ungodly and, and unchristian. The line, and bound him in an iron chain, is particularly interesting here because it suggests not only uh, an imprisonment of sorts for uh, the crime of, or the perceived crime of heresy, but binding in an iron chain. We have that industrial imagery that we've seen in some of Blake's other poems, like The Tiger. Um, iron and kind of furnace and smithing imagery is connected seemingly with Blake with the darker nature of God or what is done in the service of God as uh, it says in the tiger did he who make the lamb make thee though God has made the innocent purity of the child he is also responsible for the tyrannical religious fervor of the priest and the final thing I want to talk about is uh, the burning in a holy place where many had been burned before that allusion to the fact that this burning has happened and it has happened before and it will likely happen again the 
uh, criticism or the lack of tolerance of criticism towards the church is often resorted to with violence. So that sense that this is a cyclical occurrence, it has occurred again, uh, sorry, it has occurred again, and it will continue to occur so long as the institution of the church remains in power. The final line ends on a quite poignant rhetorical question to the reader. Are such things done on Albion shore? Albion being an ancient word for Britain. Um, and Blake is extending this question to us. How long will we be complicit in the silencing of criticism, in the silencing of the atrocities that are being done against the people? Um, it's in many ways a call to rise up and, and strike back against silencing, against censorship and against the oppressive nature of the church. Are such things done on Albion's shore? There's a tone almost of shame there, that he loves his country dearly, but he sees it as failing in its duty, especially towards the innocence of childhood. One final thing to note is that the different attitudes towards childhood that had emerged throughout the 1700s have likely informed some of Blake's thinking here. Um, you have the likes of, say, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who argues that childhood uh, and childhood innocence and education is best left to nature, that a child is best raised in nature with a single tutor. Uh, but this idea that a child, by their very nature of being born a, a kind of a blank tablet, uh, is innocent. The idea of tabula rasa, the blank slate, was uh, also kind of pioneered by John Locke, who believed that children are born innately blank, but as soon as the experience of the world starts to taint them, it darkens the slate, it, it, it stains them forever. Um, there is also the likes of, say, David Hartley, who believed that uh, children in their naive state were of a similar intellectual capacity as criminals, uh, delinquents, and the mentally insane. Not the most uh, well-rounded or thought-out theory, but uh, he believed that children could at least develop rational ideas. Uh, they were, in a sense, emerging rational beings. However, in their childish state of innocence, they were no more able to make informed or rational thoughts than a criminal or someone who you would find in an asylum. <laughs> 